My name is Lisa from the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell, and today we bring a new video of the science behind Cosmos. We just watched the man of a trillion worlds, and we wanted to give you a sneak peek behind what's going on in science regarding this. My name is Lisa Kaltenegger. I'm a professor of astronomy at Cornell University and the director of the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell, searching for life in the universe. I'm Jim Cordes. I'm the George Feldstein Professor of Astronomy at Cornell University and also a fellow of the Carl Sagan Institute. I knew Carl uh, starting way back in 1973 uh, as a very young student, and then I ended up working with him in the 1990s, and some of the work that I'm doing now, and much of the work that's being done at the Carl Sagan Institute uh, follows in his footsteps. My name is Mark Sharvari. I'm the director of the Investigative Biology Teaching Laboratories and the faculty advisor for the new Science Communication and Public Engagement minor at Cornell University, and also I'm a Carl Sagan Institute fellow and I was inspired by Carl's work as a high school student back in Hungary. The first book I read from him was actually The Dragons of Eden. And uh, since then, it's so, it's so inspiring to follow his footsteps by establishing this new science communication minor where students can learn about public engagement at the same university where Carl was working. The man of a trillion worlds picks this idea that there should be thousands of worlds or maybe a world around every other star. And to date, we actually capable to tell you that that is true. They have their own worlds. We don't know yet if they have worlds like our own, but when you look up at the sky and you count to five, so you have five stars that you count, one out of five has a planet that is just at the right distance and small, so it should, could be another Earth, and whether or not it is another Earth, whether or not there's life in the universe, that's what we're trying to figure out here at the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell. Because the Carl Sagan Institute's mission is to bring together scientists from many, many disciplines to establish the forensic toolkit to figure out how to find life in the cosmos, if it is there. And Today, we have a couple of Carl Sagan Institute fellows with me where we'll talk about specifically this episode, but the science behind it. And one of them is Jim Cordes, who actually met Carl quite a while ago and who got to work with him. So Jim, what was the first time you met Carl Sagan? So I met Carl at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was a summer student there and there was a group of us that uh, heard him lecture, but also that group uh, of students lived in the jungle in a pretty much a shack uh, that was maybe about 10 kilometers from the observatory. And he came to our shack and uh, one evening and uh, we talked with him for a couple hours. Um, he was definitely just sort of one of the guys and, and it was really enjoyable. So that's how I got to know him. And that was about five years before I came for the interview for the, the assistant professor job that I got at Cornell. Uh, so it was pretty, pretty amazing start. Needless to say, it was very stimulating working with Carl. Um, sometimes we did it at a distance because he traveled a lot and I traveled quite a bit. And I would get these, not exactly cryptic, but you know, uh, frequent emails from, from either him or his uh, aide. Uh, questions about uh, pulsars, neutron stars, uh, questions that, uh, about things that concern SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And in the 1990s, uh, the early 90s, he was very keen on working with Paul Horowitz at Harvard on a SETI survey that Paul had done. And there were some mysterious signals that they were looking at. Um, and the work that I did jointly with him had to do with how the, uh, the interstellar medium could affect those signals and whether uh, they, were, uh, they were being enhanced by the interstellar medium or, or otherwise. Uh, needless to say, Carl was really uh, on a mission to, to search what was uh, in these data and was very keen on establishing um, what they were. 
how was it to work with Carl on a day-to-day phase? Would he come by for a cup of coffee or what did you guys do? No, it was much more uh, infrequent than that because Carl was busy enough that he didn't spend that much time in the space sciences building, at least while I was, you know, when we overlapped. Uh, so, you know, I'd be perhaps sitting in a conference room talking to a colleague or a student and Carl would come walking by and he would um, look in the room and it was pretty clear he was looking for me. I'd say, hey, Carl, <laughs> come on in. Let, uh, what do you want to talk about? Uh, and and usually it had something to do, you know, very specific with something very specific. He didn't come for coffee. Uh, he was a busy man. Did Carl already work at Cornell when you started? Yes, I came here in 1979, and that was just when he was working on Cosmos. Um, so for the first couple of years that I was a professor at Cornell, I actually saw Carl more out at the Jet Propulsion Labs than I did in Ithaca. So. But Carl left a footprint not only in science, as you see in the scientific papers that, for example, he wrote with Jim and many, many other people envisioning worlds out there, life out there, maybe even in Jupiter, and how we could find life using our own Earth as a template. But as a science communicator, something so desperately needed in these times to, to actually just tell people about the excitement of science. What was his imprint, Mark? Well, he was pretty much the very first science storyteller. He was a scientist, but he was also a storyteller. And this episode of Cosmos really goes deeply into that, discussing how he brought people together. He brought scientists together from different disciplines to bring them towards the same goal, as well as engage the public. He made science accessible for everybody through the Cosmos series, through his books that inspired me. And he was truly one of the first science storytellers. So what did you, yourself, pick from all the reams of things that Carl Sagan used to engage the public? Is there one or two things that you use on a daily basis that you basically trace back to him? Well, in, we, re, we were really inspired by Carl's legacy to start a new science communication minor. And it was beautiful to talk to Anne Bruyne about it and she was very supportive of that minor as well. And now we can teach our students those storytelling techniques, how to engage the public and how to talk to non-technical audiences, how to build that trust with them, and how to share this beauty of science. And our undergraduates among Cornell is pretty much the first university starting such a minor and bringing science communication to the undergraduate level. And Yes, I used some examples from Carl, but one example is sort of a negative example that I use in my science communication course, telling the students about the Sagan effect. The Sagan effect is that scientists who did public engagement or science communication were not valued as much as writing scientific journal articles. And despite that, Carl has over 500 scientific journal articles, scholarly journal articles, he did not receive tenure at Harvard. And he was also not um, chosen to become a member of the National Academy of Sciences, for example, because he spent so much time translating scientific information for the public. And that was not valued, unfortunately. So that's the Sagan effect. And I still tell my students about that because they need to know that how much the time the world has changed. Carl was uh, interested in other worlds for sure, but he was also very concerned about this world. And much of his work that he did in the 70s and 80s uh, had to do with, um, you know, being sure that we had contact with scientists in the Soviet Union. He was concerned about uh, nuclear winter uh, from um, the very bad effects that could take place from a nuclear war. And he worked... Uh, with a lot of effort uh, trying to mitigate uh, those kinds of things. As you just mentioned, that call actually made the times change. That even so, it didn't work out for him, unfortunately, at that time, because people didn't understand how critical that mission is. The man of a trillion worlds, as we saw today, has left his imprint, not only in terms of science, but also in terms of how we all see this world. And so I hope you enjoyed our short conversation about this episode and come back if you want to hear some more.